in week two of what is uh, a five-week online virtual assembly this year. And this week we're focusing on Beirut. Yesterday we had a powerful and ultimately I found very optimistic conversation. But today uh, I'm very pleased that uh, Amanda Abi Khalil, curator and uh, the founder of TAP, which she will talk about, is able to uh, join us. She's in the middle of a whole new initiative uh, in Brazil, which I'm sure she will also talk about. And so I think some of you will remember she was able to be with us live in New York last, last year at last year's assembly, coming directly from what was then the, uh, the October Revolution in Beirut. So a city that's gone through multiple crises uh, and since the catastrophic explosion on August the 4th, the cultural sector has been reeling, uh, looking at how it can play a, a role and rebuild both civic and the cultural life of the city. So Amanda, um, thank you very much for making time and for convening the panel and curating the extensive resources list, which is on our website for people who want to read more or see more about what's happening in Beirut. But I hand over to you, Amanda, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. And thank you, CEC, for having me once again uh, in, in, in your assembly. This year is a bit unusual. It's online, um, but it's a very important format to give voices to practitioners from Lebanon during these very, very difficult times for us. As you said, Simon, exactly a year ago, I was in New York at the physical assembly and my intervention was about the revolution that had just begun. And I was talking about the promise it was opening up for the cultural sector. Today I'm speaking, uh, I will be speaking about the state of agony we're living as Lebanese citizens and um, as artists and curators and about the specificity and, and of the reality the cultural se sector is, is facing nowadays uh, in Lebanon. Uh, as you said, I'm, I am personally um, in Brazil since, since a year, so since last year's assembly, um, partly because I was stuck uh, first by the economic crisis, which, uh, which um, uh, took hold of my, of my savings. We will talk about this capital control that is affecting uh, the art scene later on, but also because of the pandemic, which uh, delayed the, the project I was working on in Brazil. Uh, I would like to first start by thanking Omar uh, and the panelists. Omar, who's in the same space with me, who took the courage of taking part in this residency. We will talk about it. I would like to thank Helena and Haig for having accepted this invitation. I know how hard it's, it is for all of us to provide the slightest effort for anything at the moment. So I really, really appreciate the time you're, you're taking for this. Um, maybe Haig, you wanna present yourself um, briefly and then we'll just like, say hello, and then I will continue with my intro before giving you um, the mic again. Uh, sure. My name is Haig Aybazian. I have uh, been co-director of the Beirut Art Center along with Ahmed Hussain uh, since January, uh, and I'm also a visual artist. Helena? Uh, I'm Elena Nasib. Uh, I've been the managing director of cultural resource Al Maurid Al Thaqafi since September 2017, uh, and I'm also a cultural researcher. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Omar Mismar. I'm a visual artist and uh, also an educator in, uh, based in Beirut. So what we've been living is a total collapse. I don't know what terminologies we're going to use. I think uh, it's also hard to think of words. Uh, yesterday, Omar Rajah had the, um, at the first part of this uh, seminar was, um, was, was, was describing the situation as a roller coaster. 
it's true that I have been away uh, from Beirut since a, since a year, the worst year um, for my country and its people. But from where I am, there's only Beirut on my mind. So I gave today's panel the, the title of Beirut, the city that is not, referring to an open letter written by Elias Khoury, a prominent Lebanese writer and thinker, which was published in Le Monde, the French uh, daily newspaper, three days after the Beirut port explosion. Um, I will read excerpts as an intro to our, to our conversation. This is not Beirut, but no, this is Beirut, a city broken and wounded, whose blood spreads like glass over the eyes, a city paved with glass, as though glass had turned into eyes, plucked out and filling the streets. In Beirut, you must tread on your eyes in order to see. And when you see, you're struck blind. A city of glassy blindness, of ammonium nitrate, and of the searing blast that swallowed the city and split the sea. This is not Beirut. Don't ask the city who killed it. Those who killed it were those who ruled it. Beirut knows it, and all of you know it. The killers of the city are the ones who tried to kill the 17 October revolution by forming a government of technocratic puppets and who unleashed the dogs of repression on the streets. The killers of the city are the communal party mafias that took the country over and proclaimed the civil war ended by converting its menacing ghost into a political regime. The killers of the city are the ones who elected Michel Aoun as president, converting the catastrophe created by oligarchy into farce. Listen well, Beirut has blown us apart to proclaim your demise, not ours. Beirut is not its past, Beirut is its present. It bleeds blood, not honor. Stop talking, shut up. Nothing you have to say concerns us. We want just one thing from you, to be gone. Go you and the bankers and everyone else who has gambled with our lives all the way to hell. Then we shall bind Beirut's wounds. We shall tell our city that it will return to us, poor but joyful. Its soul shall be renewed and though weakened by its wounds, it will hold us tight to its pain and wipe away the tears from our eyes. The time of the bastards who have ruled our lives for so long is over. I would like to dedicate this person I worked with in Beirut last year at the gallery where uh, Omar Mismar and I um, were starting to install his, uh, his solo show to Fadi Dahwish, who helped me hang several shows I curated in Beirut, to Alexandra Najjar, the three-year-old daughter of a childhood friend, Paul, to Antoun Barmaki, member of my family who died, to all the victims and the missing that these criminals have killed. Reconstruct and uh, build upon immediate needs and long-term safeguarding of the cultural sector. I'm not sure how far we will get into formulating any plans or solutions, uh, our priority is perhaps to start, to start giving the foreign audience a glimpse of what we're going through as citizens, as artists, as curators from Lebanon today. I've been away and I certainly didn't feel the effect of the blast on my body the way Omar Haig and Helena uh, felt it. Um, it reached me in deferred in waves. Um, the explosion is somehow suspended in my nervous system between its status of an image and the war traumas it awakened from my, from my childhood. The words often fail and the energy to explain also lacks. Uh, I think my colleagues here will agree with this. Um, we are exhausted, drained, but if we collapse and withdraw, they will win. And if we stop thinking and plotting and hijacking resources and energy, they will win. But at the same time, turning anger into something productive is not an easy task. But the four of us here are trying very hard and somehow um, we're managing with, with micro steps. 
So for the first part, I will ask um, Haig, uh, Omar and Helena to tell us where they're speaking from a year after the breakout of the Lebanese revolution. Sorry guys, I will not call it uprising. Revolutions are slow paced and two months uh, and a half since the massive deadly explosion. Let's start with you, Haig. Uh, what's about the present situation? Tell us about you and how you're dealing with these conflicting impulses at the Beirut Art Center. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, uh, Amanda. It was uh, nice to just listen to you uh, reading. Um, uh, and I guess I should clarify also. I, I, my, um, I also didn't feel the explosion uh, on my body. I was lucky um, to be abroad, and I came. Um, I guess a week after the the blast, I came back. Um, I mean, it's it's difficult to kind of give a a sort of comprehensive uh, image of of the current moment for me because it's not really experienced as anything comprehensive. It's something that changes all the time. It's highly unstable, kind of very basic uh, uh, tasks or um, or activities become uh, sort of complicated. People's uh, attention spans are not uh, are not quite uh, what they used to be um, so so there's these kind of more abstract things that that end up being very concrete and very kind of repeated aspects of just the daily uh, attempts to work or to or to get together or to think together um, and of course this is just a kind of you're on mute sorry can you give concrete examples of what this means? Because I think the foreign audience really need to understand what, what does it look like, you know, when, when you go to your bank trying to ask for money to buy food, you know, what do you do when you don't have electricity? Like if you could give us concrete examples would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, basically we're living in a like extremely uh, restrictive kind of uh, restrictive and oppressive uh, moment where every aspect of uh, what you would call kind of a normal quotidian life is um, uh, is made impossible essentially. So um, you know, there's been a kind of daylight robbery of the an entire country uh, with absolutely no legal structure to justify any of. Uh, of the kind of decisions or the policies, the highly restrictive policies of the banks. So, for example, uh, we're not able to uh, access above a certain amount of uh, money, and that money is not enough for even the most basic kind of uh, expenses. Um, for example, it's not enough money to buy a ticket for people who are able to leave and have access to outside, and so to just purchase a ticket or to study abroad to pay tuition but also for most people uh, to pay rent, to buy groceries. So it's like quite basic in that sense. Um, uh, there, there's no, so in terms of like our own activity here, it just means a de facto localization of our activity. So it's very difficult to pay somebody abroad. It's basically impossible. I mean, you figure out ways and you kind of have a mule that happens to be going to a place where there happens to be somebody you're working with so you figure out a way to give them cash. To, so, you know, so, um, so kind of on a financial level, this is, this is how it, uh, it translates. And then there's, of course, the, something as simple as the value of the currency, which is changing uh, on a daily basis. So there's an official rate, which is essentially the tenth of the real rate of the currency. So for those people who still have jobs and uh, are getting salaries, they get it at the official rate of 1,500. But then for everything that they're going to pay, they end up paying uh, 80,000. So, and that's uh, in addition to the fact that prices have kind of quintupled or they're just through the roof. Um, so this is on the kind of um, financial le level. So going to the bank is actually, you know, you go prepared for war and you go prepared for defeat, basically. Uh, there's nothing that you can do. Um, it's it's um, yeah it's completely kind of a transparent robbery without any legal framework but you have no the whole system is kind of uh, held together be it on a security level um, uh, and a financial level it all it's all held together 
um, and there's no possibility to kind of crack through it. Um, so what it's meant for, for kind of a, a center like the Beirut Art Center, which is a relatively large uh, white cube, it's an exhibition space. You know, it's not, um, it's not kind of like a social space necessarily. It's like, it's quite traditional in the sense that it's made for exhibitions. Uh, so it ends up very quickly feeling like a kind of big cavernous empty uh, hall. So we've been spending several months trying to figure out what to do with this with this space. What is it that what are basically trying to think about this these highly restrictive conditions and to see if there is a way to turn them into some kind of generative prompt to uh, to rethink exhibition making. So what is an aesthetic that comes out from these very pragmatic a set of conditions that can create, that has to create a new kind of visual language. Um, so that's what we kind of spend our time trying to think about on one level and then trying to, um, you know, realizing that it's not going to be something that we're going to theorize. It's something that we have to figure out, not just on our own, but with the people that we end up working with or thinking with, that we try things with, uh, that we fail with, um, and to see what emerges, if anything. Um, but it's also meant for us that basically the kind of pleasure, if I can use that word, and that's something that we're like kind of uh, intent on seeking, um, pleasure or inspiration or these kind of uh, notions that become like uh, quintessential. Um, yeah, so the focus becomes on this, on how people get together, how they think together uh, and what they end up coming up with together. Um, much more than what the actual kind of result uh, is. The process becomes the kind of uh, core of the activity. Uh, yeah. And just after the blast, the Beirut Art Center opened its space as a storage. It was one of the, these radical just, uh, gestures that you, you took um, to help people like beyond the, art, the artistic community actually. Um, you also took other um, decisions of, of, um, of shifting the programming um, online and coming up with this, with this online publication. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the programs that you thought of um, that are ongoing or have passed um, that responded to, because we, no one mentioned the pandemic, it's funny, but um, yet, uh, Amar and Helena haven't, haven't spoken yet, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really funny how in the perspective of seeing the pandemic, um, the effect of the pandemic is kind of minor next to the tragedy we're, we're living. Um, I don't know if, if, if you agree with me, Heidi. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the, the center was, uh, was uh, damaged uh, from the blast. Uh, our kind of large metal front gate kind of flew off its rail like a piece of paper and into the space. Uh, the back wall was uh, destroyed. And then there was like some kind of gypsum board and like false ceilings that, that fell. So it took us a couple of weeks to, to fix the space. And then as soon as we did, you know, obviously we weren't just going to start programming exhibitions. So we, again, we have this large space. It's uh, secured now that we fixed the door. It has a roof where, you know, many people don't have a roof or walls. So we reached out to groups that were kind of, um, you know, responding to the very immediate needs that were on the ground. So we have a, a group uh, that has been replacing windows, so they cut glass out there. Um, we have a group that um, distributes um, used furniture for people who've lost whatever, their couch or their bed. There's a group that does food boxing and distribution. Uh, there's a kind of uh, a union of, uh, of lawyers and engineers that are also kind of assessing the damages and seeing if there are cases that can be uh, kind of uh, formulated and, and fought. So that's, that's how the center is occupied right now. And that would be the case until the end of this month. And then next month, we'll try to put something together for the first time since we took this uh, position in the space. And yeah, I mean, so, you know, so we talk about the blast as this kind of uh, zero moment, but it's been a, a, a rough year. Um, well, it's been a year that started kind of uh, uh, beautifully with the, with the revolution, but it also made work kind of secondary and nobody was kind of concerned with it. 
and it was this, of course, highly uh, bodily um, experience and highly collective experience. And then when, um, you know, when COVID happened, then it was this, it became this very isolated experience, this very silent experience, and also this highly virtual experience. And it was also at this time that, you know, I had time to look at my screen again and was seeing kind of all of this, um, all this online, the shift to the online that the art world very quickly uh, kind of uh, responded to. Um, and so, yeah, we've been doing online stuff as well, reluctantly at first, um, maybe particularly so because of the, the, this kind of brutality of the transition from this highly embodied uh, moment to, uh, to this kind of virtual, but also because we believed and we continue to believe in the importance of people coming together um and so you know the idea has been we'll do stuff online and it's not of course it's not going to be some kind of like replacement to what we can do in 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 person but it's in parallel to it or it's in the meantime or something like that um and so coming back to also to these kind of very restrictive uh, conditions and thinking about them as generative uh, prompts we came up with this very simple uh uh, idea to do these micro commissions, like uh, basically coming up with a theme and the themes are, you know, um, inspired by very uh, visible daily realities um, and asking artists to respond in kind of, you know, easy, short, uh, quick uh, gestures, poetic gestures. Um, and the micro commission, like depending on what is asked uh, of the artists, the fees will kind of uh, vary, but they're always in local currency in order to kind of move on from this dollarized, um, constantly trying to calculate the exchange rate. Um, and yeah, it's it's distributed on our on our uh, social media platforms. And so every month there's a team, and it's usually four artists per month, so it's a weekly kind of launch or release. This month, exceptionally, we have. Uh, it's been a daily release because we've been working with uh, uh, illustrators and comic artists to have them kind of respond on a daily basis to the realities. So every day from uh, we have five different uh, illustrators and each day of the week is dedicated to one of them. And so throughout the month, each week, they each uh, release uh, an additional drawing. So that was one thing we did and we continue to do. Uh, and as I said, we started off reluctantly, but there's something kind of, uh, yeah, fun, uh, but also enriching. Like we just get a lot of good feedback, mainly from the artists, but also people who are started following us. So that uh, seems as important as, any, as anything else. So just this idea that, you know, artists say like, oh, this is exactly kind of what I needed. You know, it's kind of a, enough of a prompt to get somebody to, out of a flunk or to start thinking about something, but not so overwhelming of a project that, you know, they can't kind of uh, handle it. So kind of bite-sized uh, uh, production. And then we also launched uh, an online publication, uh, which hopefully will at some point be uh, also a print publication called The Derivative. And the structure of The Derivative is again, trying to kind of think very small uh, in the hopes that we can kind of unfold uh, these small nuggets into more complex uh, thought formations. And so most of the words in Arabic have a three letter uh, root. And so we give uh, each uh, editor that we invite, and there's three editors per issue, each of them get a three letter word uh, that they kind of think about and expand on. And then based on that expansion, they inv each invite five contributors to respond to one aspect of this word. And so here again, it's a kind of on a weekly basis, we release new texts and they're bilingual, either originally written in Arabic or English translated, vice versa. Uh, and each of the editors also invited artists to uh, create an artwork to accompany or to respond to each of the articles. And so uh, next month when we open the space, basically, uh, we had an artist in residence um, here for the last three months. So one side of the uh, gallery will be a solo kind of exhibition for uh, for him. Hamad Bergo is the name of the artist. And on the other side of the gallery will be the accumulation of all of these micro commissions and the artworks for the derivative. 
I would be very curious to know how you are dealing with budget planning uh, and um, programming, because there are so many um, topics, right, that 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 we have to to address between um, the need of coming together uh, during the pandemic, the need of artists recollecting th themselves and having um, concrete projects on which um, to work, but also let's not forget that the revolution is ongoing, at least this is my, this is my take. Um, and then we have a role also um, in, uh, in, uh, in that. Uh, but let's come back to this late uh, after, after this first series of, of, um, of questions. Ahmad, uh, Ahmad is here, he's across uh, the <laughs> from me. He's, we're sitting on the same table at the residency in Brazil. Um, even this far away, the situation in Beirut is not only haunting us, but informing and affecting all our conversations, our walks in the forest, our time at the beach, our plans. Um, and um, last year, Ahmad and I were crossing Beirut um, on a mo motorbike between the gallery where we were uh, installing his first solo show and the protest at night. And that's the first time we met again um, a year after and after this um, total collapse. Ahmad, how are you coping with the situation and how is it to be an artist in Beirut these days? Uh, thanks, Amanda. Hello, everyone, again. Um, I think uh, to answer this question, I, I kind of uh, summed up a timeline of, of the disasters that cascaded over us since last October. and. I did that because I think it is closely intertwined with the timeline of plans and projects that many, many of us had. Uh, for me, I was part of uh, Homeworks 8, which opened on October 17, the night that the revolution started, roads closed and people took to the streets. It was a time of um, invigorating anger and a collective cry for overthrowing the political oligarchy that have reigned over the country for the past 30 years. Uh, the exhibition closed on its opening night out of necessity because it was increasingly impossible to travel across the city to the different exhibition venues, but also out of solidarity. Uh, it remained closed for a few weeks and then deinstalled. Uh, as you also mentioned, Amanda, we had a solo show uh, together, which was scheduled for November 2019. Um, it felt untimely, out of place and irrelevant to schedule an opening amidst the revolution. Uh, the priority was the street, sometimes the mere existence of our bodies on the ground or in squares. Um, the works for the exhibition went into storage and were covered with plastic way before plastic became the city's skin after the explosion, the material that surrounds us and suffocates us in our own homes or, or what is left of them. Uh, so we decided to postpone the exhibition to January with this kind of unwavering insistence that it must happen, that its treatment of image production in times of war is part of the moment we are going through. Uh, as if we could control the timeline of the revolution or timestamp the moments within it when art becomes permissible, relevant, or simply tolerable. Um, January came and with it, the worsening of the economic crisis or the devaluation of the Lebanese lira up to almost 80% or 100% as we are speaking. It was the first time that we kind of publicly uh, uh, hear and see things such as, you know, people selling their furniture uh, in order to be able to get diapers or, or, uh, or milk. Um, added to this is, was the illegal confiscation of uh, our money in the banks, which I mentioned, the control or total freeze of uh, dollar withdrawal for small depositors. It was a capital control masquerading as financial engineering. Um, the gallery, like many other businesses, could not survive and had to close, close down. Um, and then came COVID-19. Uh, the revolution was uh, put on hold, silenced with the lockdown. Uh, COVID-19 couldn't have arrived at a better timing that suited the state government that we have, uh, as if it was a lingering tear gas bomb, a more lethal but equally equally scattering. Um, in March, we switched to online learning, which is its own beast in Lebanon with the extremely slow internet connection and the electricity cuts that can reach uh, to more than 12 hours in some areas. Um, so there we were teachers and students expected to teach and learn online as a default transition to adapt seamlessly with the, with the, with the denial somehow of the complete lack and absence of infrastructure. Uh, work became twice as demanding um, um, and the pay was in Lebanese pounds, again, minus uh, or for the 10th of the value. 
the status of part-time or adjunct faculty, which who form really the backbone of many departments and, and university-wide required classes um, remains unchanged. Um, understandably, the majority of part-timers uh, are not renewing their contracts because their demands to uh, adjusted and fair salaries in light of the collapse are, are not being met. Um, and then came the August 4 explosion. Um, I'd like to read a short text, if that's okay, uh, that I shared a few days after the explosion. Um, I think I will read this text as opposed to telling you about the aftermath of the explosion as an act of, uh, of distancing, uh, perhaps, and inability to uh, conjure on demand what, uh, what happened. Um, it's a short, short text. August 9, 2020. My week was a little busy. I survived a deadly blast that killed 155 people, injured more than 400 with 60 still missing. I drove my bike home and saw people bleeding on the streets. I saw buildings collapsing. I cried. I went to my, my house to find it completely shattered. I went to a funeral of a friend's daughter who passed away due to the explosion. I cried. I cleaned the shattered glass for four days with the help of wonderful friends, but with detachment and absolute lack of hope. I watched tens of videos of the explosion in slow motion, fast motion, and no motion, of people collapsing in front of the camera and those still looking for their loved ones. I went down to protest against this unaccidental explosion, this literal rendition of years of mounting corruption, this ineffable blow of built-in negligence. I got tear gassed and survived the bombs now served with a side of pellets. I left because I couldn't bear it. My body is exhausted, but I am very angry, a dangerously neutralizing mix. I continued covering the broken windows with plastic and watched the city through the only two available lenses now, shattered through the broken glass and blurry through the plastic wrap. Um, the funeral I mentioned, uh, which Amanda also mentioned, was for Gaia, the daughter of Ani, who was the gallerist I was planning on showing with. Gaia was the gallery director. Firas Dahawish also would have been the prepar uh, preparator and production manager for the show. He also passed away. Um, the timeline of, of the disasters uh, uh, really devoured uh, all other uh, timelines for, for, for us all, I would say. Thank you, Amar. Um, sorry, I know this was hard. Um, Helena, you're the director of one of the very few regional organizations that directly support the cultural sector in Lebanon through artists and institutional grants. Um, Al Maurid's mission is to empower, to engage, to inspire uh, creative talents in the region. But unfortunately, the upheavals in the region have been shifting your mission to one of support, of preservation, and of safeguarding. I don't know if would be the right word to use. Um, many institutions in, in Lebanon actually um, have been saved from total collapse and, disappear and, and, and uh, disappearing because of your, react your reactivity in addressing um, direct and short-term needs. What is your assessment uh, as a funding institution of the damage on cultural life? And how shall we reconstruct and build upon these, these tragedies? Thank you so much, uh, Amanda. Hello to everyone uh, with us today. Um, before I try to answer the question, which is um, very important, I want to go back to the emotions shared by uh, Haig and Omar, um, because uh, honestly, listening to them and being in Beirut, uh, I want to share with everybody uh, listening to us now, that we are really exhausted and that we are filled with so many emotions. Um, each person is feeling it differently, but there's like certain heaviness on our soul, on our hearts, on our minds. Minds that is making, that there's, there's a certain intensity to what we are experiencing. Um, people wrote about it, uh, we shared it, we are sharing it amongst each other when we meet. Uh, there's the shock, there's the trauma, there's the burnout, there's the mourning, the grief. Um, people experienced um, 
that moments close to death experiences or some people felt that they were uh, they died and then they lived again um, and there are physical pains that doctors are saying that they won't be um, gone before six months uh, similarly to the sense of exhaustion the sense of loss and the anger uh, living with all these emotions uh, is, is, is difficult and we, um, I mean, uh, we, I cannot generalize, but uh, within the arts and culture scene in, in, in Lebanon, uh, we started to come together early on from the uprising or the revolution time last October, so one year from now, and uh, that coming together has helped us to, um, to continue to, to work uh, given all these challenges. Um, maybe one emotion I haven't uh, really uh, talked about, which is the emotion of fear. Um, there's a real deep sense of fear. Uh, there's a cult uh, philosopher, French philosopher that talks about the cu culture of fear, that um, maybe what, what happened to us is that we shifted uh, very sharply between an emotion, a culture of hope uh, last October and the culture of fear that is we are really embedded in today. Uh, um, and yeah, this is just to, to share the, uh, these emotions, but at the same time, we don't want to be perceived as victims. Uh, we are very sensitive to this. At the same time, we're very sensitive now to uh, the term resilience as, as a, as a <laughs> as a term that would give us the, this like magical power of surviving everything. So we're neither victims nor uh, uh, just resilient survivors. Uh, but at the moment we are surviving and we are creating uh, many things out of nothing. So what, um, um, I want to go back to that moment of October last year uh, and share another narrative very complementary to what Omar uh, was sharing, but from an institutional perspective. Uh, October last year also, um, firstly upon an invitation by Haig, uh, a number of cultural actors, artists, etc. And then later on institutions started to meet in order to, you know, try to work together um, as part of a cultural kind of action in relation to what was happening on the streets. Um, it's important to note that we were both uh, feeling ourselves as cultural actors and uh, as citizens at the same time. And um, these meetings and these uh, kind of, um, you know, shared uh, discussions, etc., led us to all of us to um, sign um, an open strike statement uh, where we all as organizations, um, you know, in a way, um, started uh, to contribute in a way to the civil dis to the public discussion that was taking on uh, happening at that moment in time. That moment in time for the teams, because Maurit, as you were saying, uh, our cultural resource is a regional organization, so we had to continue working on our regional programs. Although we are uh, not all of us, part of the team is based elsewhere, so we have colleagues in Morocco and in Tunis and in. Uh, Egypt, but uh, the majority of the team is based in Beirut. So we had to find ways to working remotely and to continuing with the regional programs. Um, and when the uh, economic uh, crisis or collapse uh, came starting in December and then January, we had we started thinking together with, um, with colleagues, uh, partners at AFAQ, uh, what we can do because we were close to the uh, organizations working on the ground in Lebanon, but we had a different kind of position being a regional organization. So we collaborated on uh, the Lebanon Solidarity Fund uh, uh, targeting uh, organization, arts and culture initiatives and organizations uh, across Lebanon. We, the, you, you know, we, Starting from January until May, we opened the call. Uh, we got the applications around 75. Uh, we stu the jury studied the files, etc. the applications and 23 organizations were granted uh, on the 30th of um, July, three days before the explosion. Uh, 
the explosion happened and many of the organizations that were supported through this grant whom we knew that uh, we knew that uh, it's important that they continue to be active in Lebanon uh, for the coming year because there's the, the challenge was that the organization continues to exist their teams continue to be supported and uh, as they continue to exist they can work with other artists so there will be a trickle down effect and there will be some vitality continued to the sector and then the explosion happened I also missed to <laughs> Corona, COVID-19, uh, strangely, because the COVID-19, in a way, uh, uh, in February, uh, affected our programs, but not really as deep uh, as we would have expected, because we were already starting to work remotely. So we were working from home anyways. We had started to work from home because of the uprising and uh, our programs, but it really influenced other, pro because our programs are granting programs, uh, but it did influence the arts and culture scene across the region. And with the COVID-19, we also started to think of different response programs, um, because we, we did um, like a fast rapid assessment. We knew that the individual artists were the um, priority. They were like the most affected. Um, um, across the region, um, it depends. In certain countries, there were some kind of initiatives. In few, very few countries across the region, uh, but uh, most of the artists across the region needed some kind of support. Similarly to other countries in the world, where they created funds that would support artists. We, um, at the same time, in the rapid assessment, we. Uh, understood that some organization that organizations across the region will also be suffering but they will have like they will start suffering a little bit uh, after <laughs> there's like some uh, some more time if you like depending on what the covid-19 how it's going to be changing the reality on the ground uh, of the of the arts and culture pra practice um, in may we started uh, so, so by May, in May, we started four response programs. Uh, one in uh, collaboration and partnership with APAC, uh, reaching out to the arts and culture organizations in Lebanon. So that was a Lebanon specific program. And three other programs were uh, dedicated to the arts and culture sector across the region, uh, two for individuals and one for organizations. After the explosion, um, together with APAC also, we, we had to, we, acted very rapidly, we, had, we, we met and we thought that it, it, it was also, um, we identified many of the organizations that we had supported in, uh, in the initial fund. Uh, yes, uh, AFAC is the Arab Fund for Arts and Culture. Uh, so we, uh, we identified the need for a different kind of support because of the damages uh, and losses that the explosion caused. Um, but when we met, uh, when in the first week after the explosion, we started meeting in, in the rapid assessment, we also identified individuals to be priorities. Um, because individuals in that, in, the, in that part of Beirut, most affected by the explosion, many artists live there because it's uh, affordable. Uh, they had created a very vibrant um, cultural scene, uh, a lot of uh, small, uh, and, um, you know, art spaces, initiatives, etc. Uh, at the same time, some many artists had their studios inside their houses. They had their workspaces inside their houses, and when these houses exploded, they lost most of their infrastructure. And that's why, also in collaboration, we uh, opened the call for support for artists, for individuals, uh, not just artists living in Beirut, damaged by the explosion, not necessarily Lebanese citizenship, everybody from all across the region who live here, because also Beirut has been a sanctuary for many artists from across the region. Uh, and now, together also with AFAC, we are planning the, uh, the support for, for institutions. Uh, also, um, with a view of uh, of uh, like how to just uh, um, answer to the emergency needs, but at the same time to have the longer view of recovery. Because um, although all these exp uh, emotions I've ex uh, expressed at the beginning are existing, 
there's an emotion at the moment. There's uh, not just an emotion, a kind of a will or a kind of a, an energy where everybody is sharing that we feel we want to do something. And now many uh, organizations are coming together to plan um, events uh, in November and December in Beirut. Thank you, Helena. Thank you so much. I think it's important to, to clarify um, for the global, global audience that we are speaking in the past when we talk about the explosion, but um, the crisis is still ongoing in Lebanon. I mean, two days ago, um, the prime minister was appointed, which is the same prime minister that the streets forced to um, resign last year um, in October. So we are still trapped in that really in that vicious circle and um, um, things are still happening and fear is really important element. I would like to um, um, kind of build on what you were saying, Helena, about the importance of focusing on individuals and focusing on artists at the moment. Um, because it seems to me, um, as, a, as a director of an institution, that it's almost kind of irrelevant to, to think of, of institutional needs right now. Um, temporary art platform is a, perhaps the tiniest institution in the, in the Lebanese landscape. Um, um, and we've been really thinking about our priorities right now. And uh, perhaps this could be an interesting time to, to, to present and um, um, yeah, the, the relief, the, the emergency relief uh, program we, we came up with. Um, since I was blocked in, in Brazil uh, since a year uh, with an exhibition that was focusing on hospitality and guest host relations in, in, in relation to migration. Um, so the show was supposed to take place in April at the Museum of um, uh, Paso Imperial in Rio. And then it was suspended because of the, the, the pandemic. We're still waiting, we're still waiting for a date. So I decided to shift the public programming of that show uh, and to bring a uh, tap in, in order to think about um, radical, a radical form of hospitality, inviting a group of seven artists from Beirut to come to Brazil and spend uh, five weeks on a fully funded uh, relief residency in one of the most uh, beautiful forests here uh, on the coast of Sao Paulo. What sounds at first like a bit of an eccentric or ex extravagant and perhaps uh, a crazy endeavor, um, now that we're in two weeks into the residency, I think that all these doubts um, were, um, um, like we're valid, but I really see the importance of focusing on direct and immediate relief, which is opportunities for artists to recollect themselves, be in a place that is safe, have a safe roof, and be together with other people um, to think together. So we kind of um, put this really very quickly together. And I wanted to say that um, almost half uh, of the artists we reached out to, half of the artists who were nominated refused the invitation. I was actually really surprised by that, but many um, expressed uh, that they didn't have, um, that, that their nervous, the nervous system wouldn't allow them to, to be on a 19 hour plane, or um, they talked about sudden fears of heights and sudden traumas. So we are also dealing with um, a, a psychological um, effect of, of what we've been going through that is not to be um, uh, disregarded. So I don't know who and, and how we're gonna attend to this, but um, what TAP is doing at a really, really tiny scale with only seven artists, and we wish we could have invited more practitioners is really important. So I think that residencies are very interesting formats um, to, to, to think as a first step um, uh, about what artists really directly need, need right now. So this project came together with support from um, the Goethe Institute and some um, uh, direct uh, donations we kind of called for. Um, we, TAP doesn't have a space, so we weren't really eligible to any of those institutional uh, fundings um, 
that were kind of um, uh, open for, for Lebanese institutions. And um, I wanted to really share what, what we've been living here. It's been really intense. And as a curator, I've been torn between, you know, planning activities and scheduling things. And at the same time, just like leaving room for whatever happens organically. Um, one of the artists last week said that um, residencies are confusing right now because they kind of emergency residencies, relief residencies are confusing because they mix between that position of the artist as an artist who usually, you know, is expected to contribute to a residency um, or the artist as a citizen, um, as, a, as a person, sorry, as a person needing just, you know, time off and time to breathe and time to sleep. And, and, and um, so these are topics that we're, I think um, are interesting to, 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 to discuss um, when we're talking about um, individuals and the needs of um, uh, the direct needs for artists today. So yeah, Make Yourself at Home started two weeks ago. We are in Boisukanga um, and um, I've invited two psychoanalysts and curators to uh, think of the program with me. And um, this is the first time I do that. And I think it's been um, a very interesting process of building this program together with the artist. Um, so we're kind of experimenting with um, these ideorhythmic forms of, of, of living together in order perhaps to plot for what we would do when we go back home um, uh, in Beirut. TAP has suspended all um, other activities and, and programs. We had two, three projects in line for 2020, which, uh, which we, we kind of canceled. Um, and decided to really concentrate all our efforts on this very experimental format um, of the project right now. So beyond self-care and welcoming rituals, we are looking at care and, um, and hospitality in terms of um, uh, collective solidarity, generosity, um, to, to face this deadlock, deadlock we're facing in the, globally, but, but especially as uh, Lebanese and Armenian uh, citizens. We have two Armenian artists with us um, here. Um, so perhaps for the second part of the debate, I would like to focus on more practical propositions um, um, that can help us think of a possible future and um, how do we move on from here, basically? Maybe Haig could start. Um, I mean, I can obviously only kind of answer that question within the kind of framework of um, the BAC, but also um, the other the other art institutions. Um, in terms of kind of the way for us to, uh, to act, what is it that, that we can we can do? Uh, and Amanda, you you know, um, and Elena, you you guys are talking about supporting artists, and of course that's that's um, as an art institution, that's uh, something that we are also uh, concerned with. But we're also trying to think about uh, a kind of broader ecosystem, right? So to try and think about the institution as um as some kind of like as infrastructure or as as a motor for for an economy so what is the kind of breadth of uh skills uh crafts um professions that actually comprises this ecosystem um let's say to make an exhibition um but also even just to build a space um to produce artworks uh to maintain projectors um, so, I mean, this was kind of an expansion uh, of what we had come to the position kind of with the, with the initial proposal that we had come with, which was to really think about the, the, the location, the physical or geographic location of this building uh, within the kind of crazy vicinity, right? So there's a, there's a, a popular Sunday market that's literally just across uh, the street from us. 
uh, there's the so-called Beirut River, which is a kind of um, ecological, uh, disastrous ecological landmark uh, that delineates the municipal boundaries of Beirut, which is also right next to us. Um, it's this kind of uh, post-industrial, uh, super gentrified um, area. Uh, it's also an area where uh, police regularly, um, kind of civilian police regularly uh, stop people to make sure that they are, uh, that they have status in the country. So basically, uh, you know, all of the kind of um, problems of the, of the world or, you know, that, that the art world has been uh, very urgently concerned with, be it on a, on a kind of uh, ecological level, uh, social level, notions of gentrification, uh, police violence, uh, and so forth. All of them are literally at our doorstep. Um, and so how do we kind of um, deal with that reality? Um, but yeah, so we're, we're, we're trying to basically think in very practical steps about um, how this place can be a generator for small economies. Um, and so one of the things, for example, that we're thinking about is uh, starting from the lacks that we, that we notice as, as an art center. So for example, let's say there's a shortage in the country of uh, people who can, uh, you know, hang exhibitions at a very high level. Um, so how do we kind of create that, that skill set? Um, and who are the actors that we can activate in order to, to create that skill set? So, and then mm -hmm. another thing that we think about is, is this kind of intense exodus that's happening, this brain drain that's happening. And, you know, thinking of kind of uh, simple ways to, not obviously not to reverse that, but to think in an opposite direction. So can we bring people that, um, you know, are highly skilled, uh, in, in this uh, profession, but then also think about people who are doing things locally, uh, who are sensitive to the kind of politics of the context, um, and uh, people that we've been working with or other institutions have been working with to create a kind of uh, an adapted way uh, to mount exhibitions that would be sort of on par with international standards, but that would also be uh, very specific to the availabilities here. So one of the things that I kind of keep obsessing about um, is to, for example, you know, um, infamously um, projector bul light bulbs are very expensive, right? And all the more so nowadays because you would have to import it and then you're immediately dealing with, uh, first of all, trying to figure out a payment, an international payment, but also converting the currency. So it just becomes this kind of, uh, you know, this tiny piece of uh, equipment becomes this uh, prohibitive expense. I don't know. So can we think about, for example, uh, electricians that are very skilled, but that don't necessarily work at all in, in the field. And then we give them a kind of portable light bulb and see if there, there's any way that they can figure out, you know, a knockoff essentially here that, that, we, can, uh, that we can use. Like th this is the kind of level that, um, we're trying to think about, like, and again, starting from very small things and trying to see if there's a way to connect with um, other institutions who, who, who we know have uh, similar needs. At Haig, it's, it's interesting, I mean, that you're focusing on, on, on like the, the, the ecosystem as a whole and thinking of all these um, actors and, and, and players. Um, that are fundamental um, for the for the life of our cultural sector. We've been living actually. The art scene has 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 been sustaining itself for the last twenty years um, on funding from private the private sector and some regional funding. So this is something that we should kind of um, um, stress here. Uh, we have no public support whatsoever. Which, um, which really fragilizes uh, us in, in, in times like these. And now I have a feeling that, I don't know, where are those private institutions as well in Beirut? You know, like after the pandemic, after like the, the, the event is gone, um, you have a space, so you know what I'm talking about. You have a wall where you can put a logo of, of, a, of a sponsor or of a donor. Now that this kind of uh, uh, convening around uh, object-related art is gone, Private support has also disappeared in a way. Um, I've been really, you know, 
um, trying to, 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 to reach out to those institutions that have been sustaining our art scene also for the last years, and they're totally absent. So we're left even more alone um, and, and with less support. So uh, maybe you are in a good place to talk about that as well. Um, I mean, again, I just, I sort of, I try, I don't know, nowadays kind of anything that, that sound seems like it might be a bummer, I kind of try and move on and <laughs> redirect my attention elsewhere. So, you know, you say we're all the more alone and of course you're absolutely right, but um, I immediately, my impulse is immediately to, to say, are we though? I mean, like these people are gone, but then we still have uh, each other. I mean, we have other institutions and, and as uh, Helena mentioned, like it's been a year now that um, those conversations have been happening between institutions um, and the kind of the struggles are shared. Uh, and we how live in about our audiences, for instance, sorry to interrupt, but like where, where, where is our audience gone? Like how do we, what, what are the, what, what are the pr projects that we can come up with um, in this, in this place of, of extreme fragility that can allow us to build connections with our audience, because what we're doing right now, which is amazing that we're, we're, we're focusing on artists, we're focusing on workers, um, we're focusing on the livelihood of our sector, but aren't we losing connections with our audiences? I don't know, like how, how I ha this is a question I'm asking myself all the time, right? It's not a, uh, how are you thinking about that at Beirut Art Center, about these crowds that used to show up at your openings that were part of, you know? I mean, I'm doing everything to, so for example, planning for the next exhibition, I'm, I'm trying to, or we're trying to figure out all the ways in which we can avoid crowds, right? <laughs> so so it, it's about kind of trickling the, the flow of people in. Um, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. We're, I don't know. I mean, the, even the notion of audience becomes a kind of complicated thing, like audience to what? I mean, we're just talking about all of the struggles to kind of produce something meaningful or that people don't have, uh, you know, artists are not necessarily in a place where they have anything to say or whatever they have to say may not make sense. Or So it makes sense that there is no audience per se, but there are people, right? So I don't know. I mean, I, um, the conversations that we end up having with Ahmed are, are really, uh, and this is why, what I was trying to say that the process itself becomes the kind of the, 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 the core of what we're trying to do. It's, and then whatever kind of ends up being produced, you know, it may be great. And if it is, then that's all the better. But it, it's, it really is secondary. Uh, it's really about, you know, thinking together and coming up with frameworks together and bouncing ideas off of each other. You know, sharing emotions, even in this kind of weird, uh, you know, public platform, but like to, to kind of be able to vocalize these things. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I can't quantify why it's crucial, uh, but I know for a fact that it's crucial. So I think, yeah, I, I, I no longer am able to, or no longer, I currently am unable to think about, you know, you do something kind of uh, behind closed doors and then you prepare it and then it's ready to be presented to an audience. Like I'm, I think much more uh, that I want things to be kind of open and transparent and in process. And there's not necessarily a thing that's being produced for somebody to come see it. I think it's much more, uh, how can the space become a place where, you know, uh, audience or producer or institution or worker can kind of come together within a structure that makes sense for all of these uh, entities to come together. So it's not about like a social experiment. It's coming up with models that activate all of these uh, different entities uh, with a clear direction, even if not necessarily with a clear goal, right? It's, it's kind of a yeah, structure. Go ahead. Contemporary practice um, lends itself to this. I mean, um, social art practice and all these, you know, like, um, um, projects that are focusing on processes, which is really the heart of what we do at TAP uh, since 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 um, since the beginning. Um, but we 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 cannot also um, put aside the um, um, other disciplines who actually require, you know, a, 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 an audience 
you know, a proper audience per se. And I was, I was having this conversation with one of the artists in residence here with us, who's a sound artist. And it was really uh, interesting because she was saying, yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm doing these commissions online. She's uh, um, these concerts online, but at the same time, I missed this opportunity of, of, of performing in front of an audience. And this is an essence uh, of, um, of my practice and of my work. Actually, Omar Rajah and, and, and Mia Habis uh, really discussed this um, uh, yesterday with regard to, to contemporary dance, and I thought it was a very um, interesting element, which kind of differs from our po po uh, position as, as maybe curators or visual artists, where we can kind of turn the situation um, um, on our side, let's say, or, or to our um, uh, benefit, I don't know. Uh, perhaps, um, I don't know if, if I'm just looking at the time here, I would like Hannah, uh, sorry, Helena to, to um, uh, tell us a little bit about this funding that is being channeled um, to Beirut, this fresh money coming to Beirut and that regional f um, uh, institutions like yours are kind of uh, distributing to cultural institutions and to artists. Uh, we've been through this before in the 90s after the war, uh, so we've witnessed that kind of big amounts coming in all of a sudden, and we, we know uh, uh, the risk of that as well. So how, how is um, Al Maurid Cultural Resource and Afaq um, centralizing this, 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 let's say, organization of, 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 of the money, and, and how are you assessing actually um, uh, the needs across scales of institutions and, and disciplines. Uh, thank you, Ananda. Um, I want, um, Haik was saying something I wanted to comment uh, um, on the different, on, on the multiple levels, because um, I feel what we are also engaging in at the moment is um, trying to think in a fresh way uh, about our practice that applies to artists uh, and about the discourse as well about how institutions and organizations and new initiatives are thinking of discourse as well as practice. So both of these are being re, re, rethought or re, not rethought completely, but it's, it's, it's different. Uh, and there's a certain kind of questioning that's happening as we go. Uh, one thing that is a bit, uh, let's say, new, or I will not say totally di different, but it is in a way different, is that two regional organizations are working together on, on the implementation of one solidarity fund. Um, coming together has been uh, really valuable uh, on multiple fronts. Um, at the same time, there's a learning curve in coming together in the discussions that's happening in the way we do things in the way we uh, uh, thinking of how things need to be done. Both of us how, have our systems, um, long uh, practice systems of uh, grant making and uh, opening calls and uh, jury evaluations and uh, et cetera, all these uh, grant making systems. And in fact, we have also discovered that uh, during the working together that there's a lot in common and these differences are, are uh, minute, I mean, not major. And that allowed us to, to have a very smooth working uh, relationship, not only in terms of the vision of what the Lebanon Solidarity Fund, ha uh, how need, it needs to work. It does not, what we, what we identify that it does not need to work in the same uh, way we usually do our work is that we identify things and we implement them. Uh, in a way, it, uh, it was done, um, as Rima would say, uh, in the opposite way. Uh, we had to follow the needs on the ground in a, in a, in a, in a um, rapid, more rapid uh, speed that led us to be working at the same time while assessing. So it was a kind of a really, uh, really fast, very, very difficult, but at the same time, we were feeling the urgency and the responsibility. Uh, and that's why, why we were working together, not 
just as two uh, regional organizations, but doing these assessments together with all colleagues and, and uh, stakeholders on the ground. Uh, we had the, uh, for sure, obviously the ecosystem approach in our head. That's why we uh, prioritized, we had priorities and we had the vision of uh, starting with the emergency and recovery phase and then uh, building phases, uh, um, thinking together, not alone, but uh, uh, together with, with others of what, how would the phase two and phase three fit because we, it was clear that we need more than a year or like minimum a year for us to be in a way uh, coming back to some kind of a, um, vitality that would allow us to, to, to gain back our, our, uh, our practice. Um, in the phase one, uh, we already opened uh, one round for uh, to support individuals. The second round would go to uh, artisan shops and other um, kind of um, entities or structures. So it's not just for institutions or arts and culture organizations. It's a bit more open for both in the, in the nonprofit and the commercial, because also all of them are suffering and they're suffering in a, in a very, um, um, very drastically in a way that's like uh, would uh, life or death kind of uh, kind of uh, harsh uh, living reality. Um, at the same time, uh, we're also thinking of, of the need for production for for the for uh, support funding for artists to produce their work. In, uh, um, and more uh, longer term, the medium and longer term, we're assessing now and it's in, in process together with, with others, how we need to um, uh, think of uh, or be uh, responsive to how the artists themselves are trying to self-organize, how they're thinking of the need for syndication, how they're thinking of the need for collective collectives. Uh, and how these different different ways of coming together would kind of create something new uh, in terms of practice and discourse, which we are still in the moment. We're still uh, witnessing how these, uh, we, we, some people are trying to study how things happened before, but at the same time, there's a certain freshness to, to how things will happen uh, this time. I don't think it's, there might be some similarities with the 90s, but I think it's a very different moment um, in terms of um, the number of uh, artists and the cultural actors uh, who are very much qualified and very much um, also working together with a very strong kind of solidarity. Uh, I also think that the um, the way the uh, organizations like uh, Afak and Maurid are very sensitive to the importance of, of uh, uh, the diversity of, uh, uh, of diversity in its multiple forms and of uh, enriching the ecosystem in a way that is, uh, that is not excluding, in a way that's very inclusive and that uh, takes into consideration um, the, the, the challenges we're living uh, and the contribution of everybody. Uh, do you have a follow-up question? Or? <laughs> no, I mean, thank you so much. I think that you're right. Um, it's a different moment, perhaps because <clears throat> solidarity and, and doing together is the only way out right now, is the only way possible. Um, maybe 10 years ago, it was... Um, something that was more in the discourse um, of wanting to be together, wanting to do things. I mean, I've been taking part in those um, institutions uh, coming together meetings since 2011, since I moved back um, to Beirut. And I remember when I was um, a director of the hangar back then, um, Zico, uh, who's one of the director of an institution in Beirut, asking, he invited in 2011 a group of institutions, including the Beirut Art Center and others, um, to, to uh, say, okay, how about we buy a printer 
together in order to pr to print our posters and it was really you know it was it was it sounded extremely um anecdotal back then like i mean come on right like uh, we're not doing that it, it, it wouldn't make sense who would take care of it where would we put it i think that we're on a level right now where these um, problematics and these questions are essential because we have no other way um a temporary app platform where two people uh, Noor Osayran, my colleague, has been working for um, the last year with a deferred salary that will, I don't know when I will be able to pay her. We, I, I'm physically um, in Brazil, so all the operations of um, a temporary pla platforms accounts are frozen and are impossible because I'm not physically there. And so in times like these, I would have, you know, loved to you know, maybe call the Beirut Art Center and say, okay, why, why, you know, why don't you give Noor an office for, for three weeks? And then we have to think of these mutual uh, uh, um, uh, resources and, and, and sharing resources, whether they're human or technical, physical. I think that this is a necessity. We have no way out. So it's a very different uh, um, logic um, that we need to, to, to think about. Omar, uh, perhaps you would like to talk about what artists need <laughs> right now. You're here. Uh, all, of all of them. I heard you. I heard you do a kind of um, survey with uh, the other fellows. So it would be nice if you could also speak about your experience um, in that emergency presidency and how this nature of the project. Um, can be um, useful or not. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is in no way speaking on behalf of anybody, really. I have like a preliminary uh, wish list that hopefully will turn into a to-do list uh, at some point in time. Um, uh, one of the first things is that I want a dyke for president. I want a person with AIDS for president. I want everything that Zoe Leonard wanted in her work for uh, all of the wish list of Zoe Leonard. In addition to that, um, I think, um, uh, can you uh, mute your uh, sound? Sure. <laughs> uh, I would begin with the need of uh, solidarity between artists and cultural pra practitioners that really precedes any institutional, organizational, or categorical support. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of, I'm hoping for a camaraderie that of belonging to a cultural sphere or ecosystem, as Haig uh, uh, called it, irrespective to start with at least of the different practices and whether they resonate with us or not. It's, it's a clearance for a raw common ground where power dynamics are paused, are held at bay, and a, a, a horizontality is, is emphasized. Everything can can rise from there. And such ground is quite difficult to arrive at, I think, especially with the heavy clique system that is entrenched in the Beirut uh, art scene. Um, one can argue that such cliqueness is essential uh, and indispensable in social formations, but I think it's also uh, a danger is othering different practices of, um, of amping up a certain harsh vein of criticality to the point that it abolishes curiosity and generosity and reproduces a power dynamic. We can also argue that such cliqueness is, is a distant cousin of nepotism, which is a major uh, default practice uh, in Lebanese politics. Uh, such solidarity requires the patience for self-organizing really for listening, um, but not so much money, which is required everywhere else on, on this kind of uh, uh, wish list uh, wannabe to do this. Uh, I think we need to push um, for artist fees to become part and parcel of our label, not as an afterthought or as a gesture or what is left of the grant money. Often we feel that getting a chance to publish or exhibit is a compensation or a form of capital and we are always grateful for it, but, but the reality is that it is, it, is, it is not enough, especially with COVID, with the economic crash, with the blast in Beirut. Uh, many, many of us juggle between different jobs to support ourselves financially. Our art practices become that which we will eventually get to after the modest money-making duties are fulfilled. And, and I think such compartmentalization of jobs and art practices naturally leads us, leads many of us to not be fully present in the practice. If not the entire practice, many of the components, many of its components are constantly deferred. Um, 
another ongoing wishful thought is to have health insurance for artists, of course, among the many other uh, insurance professions in, in Lebanon. Unionizing or rehabilitating and restructuring unions and syndicates, as, as Elena was, was mentioned, uh, mentioned, is also key. Um, in the aftermath of the explosion funded residencies uh, that also provide artist fees are crucial. Um, it is necessary for, for many artists to be able to, to extract themselves from, from the site of trauma, however briefly and imperfectly, in order to recoup also, however, incompletely. Um, and, and for me, I think uh, this is precisely what this residency is doing. It's, uh, um, uh, you know, it comes with a, with a, with a, a huge kind of mixture of feelings of a separation anxiety from a place that I'm not sure I want to be in in the first place, but you know, like leaving Beirut even in, at, at its worst is, uh, is such a hassle. Um, coming here uh, and, and, you know, being with people who have experienced uh, something similar with difference. Um, it is not the topic of the hour. It is not something that we discuss all the time, but it's something that we, uh, uh, we are, uh, and it's, uh, it is something, it is that which we are in, in its aftermath. Uh, and by default, um, uh, you know, we, we share anecdotes, we share stories, we, we talk about going back to, to Beirut. Uh, and what would that mean? Uh, we itched together. We all got really severely bitten by mosquitoes, uh, by tropical mosquitoes here. Um, I think uh, the status of, of exhibition spaces shifted from very rare to almost non-existent before and after the explosion. And it's important to ask, uh, how can we uh, reapproach exhibition spaces as sites of thinking, seeing, and listening that can also foster that raw ground of solidarity while, while embedding itself in the civic and political life of the city. Uh, in that vein, exhibition spaces become polysemic entities or, or ecosystems, again, like, that can imbibe and spark a range of practices, processes, and approaches to art making, which are not centered on the object or product, but that also do not shun it or essentialize it as irrelevant by default. I think it's a really uh, kind of... Um, 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 uh, Careful, careful ground to treat, but I think I mean it's 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 rewarding if we are aiming for this kind of raw uh, ground of solidarity. Um, and lastly, uh, workspaces have become now even more crucial than ever with the loss of studios and homes, which also functioned as studios. Uh, a huge uh, uh, one of the main reasons why I'm here is is precisely the kind of the my my window my windowless apartment and. Uh, the plastic crap, which really just uh, 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 consumes all other sounds, one cannot hear oneself think. And um, uh, to kind of focus on the needs for workspaces, I know that uh, Ashkel Alman has taken an initiative in that in that vein, uh, offering workspaces to artists who lost them as much as their space allows. And uh, I mean, hopefully, we can find more of these initiatives, more of these um, spaces. Thank you, Omar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amar. So sorry. Um, thank you um, for this. Uh, it was an exhaustive wish list. Um, I think that um, rethinking exhibition spaces, rethinking residencies, um, rethinking commissions um, are part of these exercises um, that we all um, are doing and, and I hope we'll do more together in order to think of, of what the reconstruction or rebuilding from this uh, could look like. Uh, I mean, with this current residency that I'm organizing here, I heard artists saying, ah, we are in this bubble or in this temporary heaven or um, in this uh, parenthesis. I mean, I would really like to, to see it as a, as a temporary autonomous zone for us to really challenge each other um, in, in, in our ways of attempting to do things together and to think in a horizontal way um, and think of the ecosystem of residencies also as, um, as something that generates um, thoughts and, 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 and good practice. Um, we have five more minutes. Um, perhaps we can open up for questions from the audience um, because um, there was a, a registration for the Q&A on Zoom. Um, and if, and if no questions pop up, then maybe we can go on with our conversation. Let's see. 
Anyone? Yeah, Amanda, I answered one question from the audience and um, uh, the person, I'm not sure whether the name is right, Luler, uh, was saying that um, the audience would like to hear some positivity um, and uh, like we need to empower the Lebanese people and uh, why we're rejecting the word resilience. Uh, I tried to answer based on <laughs> uh, briefly because um, you shared uh, very important articles that explain this nuance with the uh, use of the word resilience. We don't mean not, we don't want to say that we don't want to be resilient, but it's how it's being used, the framing of, of, uh, of uh, resilience as like a construct. But I want to share just to bridge with, with, uh, with uh, our audiences uh, today, because there's this uh, feeling of um, uh, constant existential threat and our need for survival that keeps pushing us and, and this sense of like the pressure of survival that maybe not everybody across the world is living. Uh, it might be the case of many people, especially people of color uh, in different uh, parts of the US, for example, but it, it might not be a generalized kind of uh, uh, experience. But at the yeah. same time, we, uh, we, we are very much aware that at the same time we need to survive, but we need to think strategically with a long-term view about the systemic change and the uh, lasting change that we as uh, arts and culture people, we are uh, exerting or we are influencing in the world uh, and how we're contributing to, to, these, uh, to the change of what kind of world and uh, future we want to live in. Because it sounds very dystopic uh, from where we are and we don't want to be pessimistic. We want to, in fact, kind of call uh, for everybody, for uh, friends and colleagues across the world uh, to build together these spaces where we can produce or think or imagine uh, together uh, these different ways of, of being together, uh, of sociality, of how our world would look like. And this is where, uh, this is where we are in a way still succeeding. So when we speak about, uh, um, like we are still alive, we are still producing. In fact, it's, it's really, it keeps, uh, it's formidable. It's, it's amazing how across the region, not just in Lebanon, like now everybody is working on the, today they are now in a meeting, uh, co collaborating to produce the radical stages, Beirut radical stages in November. There has been, um, uh, film festival in Palestine and Ramallah uh, in the open air uh, this week. There are radio, radio initiatives all across the region where everybody is working voluntarily to produce content that is like really progressive and interesting and talking to each other. So we, we don't want to say that nothing is happening. Many things are happening and these things that are happening are both trying to um, save us as, as, uh, as communities and individuals, and at the same time, pushing the boundaries. Uh, and uh, we hope that you, you, you take this as not as a sign of, of despair, but as a sign of um, kind of uh, uh, more, I don't know how to say it, more, um, uh, more instinct. Um, instinct. Hmm? instinct, I would say. Yeah, more kind of the, it's the break of the fighter, you know, the fighter when they need to take a break and then fight again. So uh, now speaking to you, we, we, we are taking like the break of the, yeah, of the fighter. Haig is sitting um, in front of a, a, a checklist. So we are definitely working. Uh, we are in our spaces. I mean, Temporary Art Platform managed to put together an emergency relief residency in no time. We um, made visas happen, funding happen, a PCR test on time, um, uh, channeling uh, almost like rubbing a bank to able to pay Qatar Airways for seven flights. I mean, no, we. this is not a negative picture at all um, uh, we are all kind of doing whatever we can I think uh, at least here the four of us um, maybe we could invite um, the audience to have a look at the um, the new publication of the Beirut Art Center which really provides very very interesting um, insights about these you know 
conflicting feelings that uh, writers from Beirut um, are also sharing. I could also add it on the reading list um, um, of the panel. Um, do we have more questions from the audience? Okay, so we don't have questions. Perhaps um, we can uh, conclude here. Um, thank you, CEC Artsling. Thank you, Haig, Helena, and Omar. Um, this was a heartwarming um, conversation, even digitally. We should have more of these, hopefully physically soon. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Does anyone want to add something? <laughs> Cheers. Bye.